chocolate is such an incredible ingredient and beyond being obviously extremely delicious, it's also utterly fascinating in its process, history, the science and its varieties. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how you can make your own chocolate from scratch at home or in a restaurant. From choosing your beans to roasting and processing them and then grinding them, refining and tempering to end up with a chocolate that is truly your own. And I'll show you how I use my own homemade chocolate on my menu, uh, filled with a roasted hazelnut puree and served alongside the tea and coffee at the end of my tasting menu. This will be the first of three videos on homemade chocolate and the next ones will build on what I show you here and go on to make some variations like an oat milk chocolate and a caramelized almond milk white chocolate. And just before I show you the process, it makes sense to say why I think it's worthwhile to make your own chocolate at all, especially when there's so much great quality chocolate out there now that you can buy. So for me, I love making things from scratch and being involved in the whole process. I think I learned so much from this and it helps me to feel really deeply connected to my craft and my food. And it's part of the unique experience for my guests too, I think, that I'm on my own in the kitchen and so everything that they get is made by me, from distilling my own gin to the, the surplus honey from my bees. And that's one of the things that makes up the unique experience here, I think. And making your own chocolate gives you so many ways that you can tweak the flavor profile to exactly what you want, from choosing the variety of beans you work with to how far you roast them and what percentage cocoa solids chocolate that you make, and then whether you want to include other ingredients into your chocolate. So you can make a finished chocolate that is exactly as you want it. I wouldn't expect most people to suddenly jump to making all of their own chocolate, but I do hope that once you've watched this, you feel like giving it a go and that you find the process as magical as I do. So let's get into the process and I'll put the full recipe and method down in the video description too. So the first decision to make is what cocoa beans you're gonna work with and the variety, where in the world they're from and their fermentation is all gonna fundamentally affect the flavor of the chocolate. One of the first things that I did when I was working on my chocolate was to buy a range of cocoa beans and a range of chocolates made from those beans and taste test them to try and hone in on the flavor profile that I wanted to work with. I get my beans from Solkiki, who are a craft chocolate makers here in the UK and they direct trade with cacao farmers and have a real emphasis on ethics, sustainability and incredible quality. I really like their Esmeraldas beans and these would be great for people making their first chocolate because they're relatively easy to work with and have a really beautiful flavour. But it's their Chuncho Cusco beans that I'm using on my menu. It's got a flavour profile that I really like with notes of grapefruit, peach, pink flowers and dark sugar. If you're not in the UK, I would look for good craft chocolate makers in your area and see whether you can source your beans from them. Next up, roasting the beans is really important for the finished flavor of your chocolate. How far you roast them, how dark or light you go is gonna change how chocolatey the flavor is and also how much of the acidity from the original fermentation comes through. Roasting also starts to separate the skins from the cocoa beans, which is gonna make our next steps much easier. I do this just in my kitchen oven, but a drum roaster or a converted coffee roaster would be perfect but I've found the oven works really well just for my small setup. So I roast my beans at 160 degrees for 10 minutes, then drop the temperature to 135 degrees for another 10 minutes, and then lastly let them sit at 80 degrees for the final 10 minutes. And I try and stir the beans regularly during the process to make sure they roast evenly. Once the roasted beans are cooled, we need to crack them ready for winnowing, which is separating the skins from the cocoa nibs. You can crack the beans using a mill, but for my small batches, I've just been using a Ziploc bag and then lightly cracking the beans in there using a mallet. But don't go crazy and crush them into a powder. You just want to lightly break them into even sized nibs. Then I use a hairdryer to separate the skins from the nibs and you can either drop the nibs in front of the blower to let the lighter skins be whisked away or you can toss the nibs in a bowl whilst using the hairdryer to remove the skins. 
This takes a while, it's a bit of a pain, it's probably my least favourite part of the process, but it is important and this method is surprisingly effective. Now, next we get to think about the formulation for our chocolate and how dark we want it to be. In the next video, I'm going to talk about how you can make milk chocolates and give you an example of a really delicious oat milk chocolate, but we're going to focus on dark chocolate here to start with. You can experiment and make changes to your percentages, but the example I'm going to give you is the 65% cocoa solids dark chocolate that I make for my menu. So for this, I'll be using 675 grams of the prepared cocoa nibs, 395 grams of sugar, 56 grams of good quality cocoa butter, and four and a half grams of lecithin. There's so many possibilities and options here and ways to get exactly the chocolate that you are after. And I made a number of small test batches before I settled on this percentage as the one that I wanted to work with. Next, we need to grind our chocolate. And for a really high quality chocolate, it's crucial that we're able to get this extremely fine to the point that when you eat it, you can't detect any particle size at all. And the only way to really do this on a small scale is using a stone grinder. A blender won't go fine enough. You're gonna need a melange like this that you can run for 24 to 48 hours to get a texture fine enough for good quality chocolate. This one was reasonably priced at around £100 and it served me really well so far. I can make about a two kilo batch of chocolate at a time in it, but it is worth knowing this is really noisy when it runs. So given you're gonna have to run it for long periods of time, that's just something you should have in mind. Before making my chocolate, I warm up my grinder and the stones in my dehydrator and you could do the same thing in a very low oven. And just warming that up is gonna help everything to grind smoother and quicker and put less pressure on the machine. And then next, before we add anything solid, I add a little of my melted cocoa butter just to lubricate the stones too. Now I'll give my cocoa nibs a quick blend in the blender before I put them into the grinder, just to start them off breaking down and give it a little bit of a head start. And you can do the same thing with the sugar too. It really helps if your ingredients are warm as you're adding them too. Again, it just helps everything to run smoother and go a little bit quicker. So I add the cocoa nibs into the grinder bit by bit over about an hour. And I keep the lid off the grinder whilst it's grinding, at least for this first couple of hours to let any volatile flavors left over from the fermentation escape. Then I'll add in the rest of my warmed cocoa butter. After about six hours of grinding, I'll add in my sugar and I add in a little bit of lecithin for fluidity. And this is optional, but I find it makes my finished chocolate easier to work with and cast in molds. Then once all my sugar is in, I'm gonna let the mix continually grind for at least another 24 to 36 hours. So that by the end, the whole mixture will have had nearly two days continuous grinding. And then when you taste the chocolate, you shouldn't be detecting any grains, any texture, any particle size at all. Now you could just temper your chocolate at this stage, it's basically ready to work with and the heat generated by the grinding will have helped to really refine the chocolate and drive off any unwanted volatile aromas. But you can go through one extra stage of conching if you really want to get the best quality chocolate possible. Conching basically means we'll blend the chocolate at a slightly higher temperature for a period of time, which will help to really nicely evenly distribute the cocoa butter and also just help to drive away any last residual unwanted flavors from the fermentation. I got some advice on how to conch my chocolate in a thermomix from Michael Lesconis. And I do this by blending the chocolate in a thermomix set continuously at 65 degrees with a little desk fan blowing over the top to give a little extra aeration. I'll let this run for two to four hours and then that's my chocolate ready for tempering. Tempering is really important to make sure that the chocolate has the correct texture and flavor release and that it can be worked with properly. I temper my chocolate using cocoa butter silk and I'll go over that process here briefly but it's its own topic really and I've made a full video where I go in depth on the process and how I do this. In short, I basically make my own tempered cocoa butter just very simply by holding cocoa butter at a precise temperature of 33.6 degrees Celsius for over 24 hours. And then I add this tempered cocoa butter 
into my melted chocolate to seed it with the type five cocoa butter crystals that I want in order to get a nice tempered chocolate. And that's about it. It gives me really beautifully, reliably tempered chocolate every time. And if you wanna see a bit more in depth about the process, you can go and watch that chocolate tempering video in full. And then to make my filled chocolates, I pour my tempered chocolate into polycarbonate molds. And then after a minute, I invert them and tap out the excess chocolate. And that creates these lovely little thin shells. And then I can fill those chocolate shells with my roasted hazelnut puree. And lastly, I cover that over with more tempered chocolate and then let my chocolates set. And that gives me my finished little chocolates that I serve at the end of the tasting menu. It feels to me like a really nice way to end the meal with homemade chocolates made completely from scratch in house. And it also nicely mirrors the start of the meal that begins with the homemade gin and tonic with gin that I'm distilling myself. I think these help to underline the work and care that goes into everything on the menu and how passionate I am about my craft. And again, I hope it adds to the uniqueness of the experience and it's something I'm really excited to share with my guests and to talk with them about. So I hope you found this interesting and that you might fancy giving it a try yourself, but even if not, I hope it's given you a deeper understanding of the process. All of this will serve as a foundation for the next couple of videos where I'm gonna show you how you can get creative with ingredients that you can add into the chocolate and how you can make a really delicious oat milk chocolate that I really prefer over any dairy milk chocolate that I've tried and a caramelized almond milk white chocolate. So you might wanna to subscribe to make sure you see those next couple of chocolate making videos and thanks for watching, I'll see you soon.